welcome everybody to Wisdom from Our Neighborhood. We're so happy to have you join us tonight. Uh, Pat, Wisdom from Our Neighborhood is a part of Paths to Understanding, which is formerly the Tracy Levine Center and Neighbors in Faith. Our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking, through inspiring stories, nurturing relationships, and acting together for the common good. Tonight, I'm so excited to have three people on tonight to to who, who I respect so much. Um, one of them is Dr. Jeff Burns, a former evangelical charismatic Christian minister of 18 years. He also is a former East Coast director and director of coaching for Peace Catalyst International. Dr. Burns served with Bridges to Common Ground and is currently on staff with Common Ground Consultants. He intends to start his own nonprofit called Pathways to Peace. Dr. Burns shares his peacemaking journey with Muslims in the U.S. and abroad in a series of popular stories that he shared around the world in churches, mosques, and synagogues. Jeff has been a peacemaker between the Muslim and Christian communities since 2005. As an evangelical charismatic pastor, his world got rocked and he renounced Islamophobia after an encounter with a little Muslim child named Omar in a Starbucks coffee shop. After that encounter with Omar, he became a peacemaker and a friend to Muslims, where he discovered the core message of Jesus, loving one's neighbor. Jeff, welcome. Welcome to be here. Glad to be here, Terry, as always. Yeah. Thank you. And with, with me as well is Dr. Mikhail Muhlenberg, who works as a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary and Biola University, teaching Muslim-Christian relations, conflict transformation, and grassroots peace building and justice work. She has an MA in English and Journalism, and a Master's of Divinity, an MA in Intercultural Studies, and a PhD in Intercultural Studies. She co-founded a grassroots Muslim Christian peace building initiative called Two Faiths, One Friendship that has connected over 2,000 Muslims and Christians. The initiative has been nominated for and won several awards. Additionally, she is actively involved in addressing the issue of mass incarceration through advocacy, interactive educational experiences, local grassroots activism, restorative justice initiatives. It is her passion to mobilize the next generation to be reconciled with workers in the way of Jesus and their own lives locally and around the world. Michal, welcome. Thank you, it's good to be here. And then finally, Dr. Bill Clark has been the, dir the director of, Northwest Director of Peace Catalyst International since 2001, to, since 2012, excuse me. A PCI is a faith-based nonprofit that works closely with building bridges between Christian and Muslim communities. He and his wife, Julie, lived and worked in China for 10 years before moving to Kazakhstan. Living and working among Muslims in Central Asia is what birthed in them the desire to be peacemakers upon their return to the United States. After discovering the local Bosnian Muslim community loved jazz, he promoted a series of jazz concerts that raised money for humanitarian projects in both communities. Bill, welcome. Thanks, Terry. Good to be here. Thank you. So, um, so Jeff, I'd like to start with you and, and ask, what do you, do you appreciate about evangelical Christian, the evangelical Christian movement, and how has that shaped you as a person? Yeah, I would have to, I gave a lot of thought to that question. Now, thank you for sending me questions in advance. I like that. It gives a, a slow brain the chance to process, you know. Um, well, evangelical, the evangelical movement was the vehicle in which God saved my life. I was a 13-year-old. I, I was a very unusual 13-year-old. I read, I was reading Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler, Origins of Species. I was, uh, I was always looking for truth. And I came from an alcohol, my father, I was the son of a, an alcoholic. My father was a, a coal miner, president of a local union. He was later became a federal mine inspector. So I grew up in kind of a chaotic family situation. And so I was a wild child at, at 13, uh, way, way, experienced way beyond my years for that age. And I guess that's why I'm a little more overly protective of my 13 year old daughter. And, uh, but but my soul, there was nothing large enough in my life to fill my soul. So I was not just an evangelical. I was a fundamentalist evangelical. So when I, I went into the Methodist church early on, heard the gospel, and I realized that God was large enough to fill this troubled teenager's soul. And that's what I realized, that God was large enough to do that. that nothing else was large enough. Uh, 
you know, the things I was doing weren't large enough. The things I was involved in weren't large enough. And people, you know, as Christians, I'm speaking to Christians now, and I also have a large Muslim audience. But for Christians, whether you're Episcopal, Lutheran, it doesn't matter what denomination, you know, Jesus is important to all of us. And we have some have more of a, a dramatic encounter like I have. Some, it's a lifetime, you know, of encounter from the moment they're christened on up. And so Jesus filled, you know, it, it changed, it completely changed my life. And what it did as a 13 year old, and this, I'll always be grateful for this. Uh, evangelicalism kind of gave me a grounding. You know what I'm saying? It gave me a grounding. At that time, being a fundamentalist, I thought I had all the answers. <laughs> 13 years old, I'm like, I know my mission in life. I'm to save the world. The world's going to, you know, Jesus is going to come back before I'm 30. I hope he doesn't come back before I get married. I mean, all the crazy thoughts and stuff that go on. And, and it really, I thought about, well, and another thing it did, it gave me a deep uh, respect for the Bible. I, I, you know, I gave me a deep respect for the Bible. I was an avid Bible reader. Um, I still have a deep respect for the Bible. I just don't, I don't look at it the same way I did when I was 13. You know, the, I realized that there's multiple uh, ways to look and appreciate the Bible. But evangelicalism gave me that. It gave me, uh, evangelicalism helped me to have passion in sharing my faith. You know, it wasn't a dry thing. It was a very passionate thing. I led, you know, a lot of coal miners and rough people and, and intellectuals as a kid. I led them to Christ. And it also gave me, believe it or not, a strong sense of social responsibility. Mm -hmm. I, uh, it, when I was between 13 and I started officially preaching when I was 16, between 13 and 16 years of age, I was visiting prisons. I was going into hospitals. Uh, I can remember on Sunday afternoons, I'd say, man, I feel, I feel bummed out today. What can I do? Oh, let's get my mind off myself. And back in those days, you didn't have to be a chaplain to go in the hospital in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So I came in the, during the Jesus movement. That's when I came in. So I would literally on a Sunday afternoon go visit every person in the hospital and pray with them and read the Psalms. Or I would go to the prison. All these were within walking distance. They'd let me in. I'd talk to people on death row. I'd talk to people. And I felt good. So it gave me a real strong sense of, of social responsibility, personal piety. So I'm very grateful for those parts. You know, Brian McLaren wrote a wonderful book called Generous Orthodoxy, Why I'm Evangelical. Why I'm, and I, and he, he walks through the whole list. And so I have to look back on that and say these were the good things. But there was also a trauma side to this. Um, we didn't have all the answers. We don't have all the answers. Evangelicalism is a new movement. It's only a little over a hundred years old, you know, um, and the evangelical flavor we have today. I mean, it's I've been around, you know, Wesley, well, I, someone look at Wesley's evangelical, but yet his big thing was to bring people to the table more than anything. And I looked, but there was this dark side. I went to a very conservative Christian university that very, was very Machiavellian in the way they advanced their call. Anything was good for the cause. It was very disillusioning. I pastored four churches in the South. I dealt with former KKK members. I dealt with racism and exclusivism. So there was this wonderful side. And there was this other side where it was not uncommon for pastors to call black people the N word from the pulpit. And I stood against that. And I paid a, 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 paid a, a big price for that. So uh, I'm at the point now I can look for a long time. I was very, um, I guess, resentful and bitter at evangelicalism. I think it's been hijacked. I do. I think that uh, it's obvious for the last 13 years, the Southern Baptist Convention has declined every year in membership, but it's losing the 45 and under crowd. So I say this when, so people say, oh, you should, I did it. Well, the interview I did with you, evangelical said, oh, you betrayed us. And you said, I said, wait a minute. No. I said, not all evangelicals are bad. There's wonderful evangelicals. Uh, there's evangelicals that love social justice, like Mikhail and, and Bill. And there's evangelicals that want to change the, the structures of things. And, and uh, so I deeply appreciate that. And I think there's a movement happening that doesn't fit the, 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 the far right political agenda. And I think the younger generation is just not buying it anymore. So and uh, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Well, yeah, and I, I just want to say that, like, you know, every movement, every Christian movement right now has work to do. It does. I mean, it, Absolutely. There's just, there's just, that's just the way it, it is right now. And I think all Jesus has asked us to do is to, is to, is to do our work, you know. Uh, exactly. So, 
Michal, uh, what do you appreciate about evangelical Christianity and how has it shaped you as a person? Yeah, I think for me, um, I grew up in, in uh, Europe. Um, and so for me, evangelicalism um, was something that connected us to a global community, if you will. Um, growing up in the Netherlands, uh, about 20 minutes south of Amsterdam, uh, I would say there's a very small group of people, one that would call themselves Christian and then um, even smaller, the evangelical movement. Um, so I'd say like maybe 95% of the population uh, is atheist or agnostic. Um, and I was made fun of a lot growing up for even believing God existed, um, also in university um, that I went to. And so we kind of look to the United States um, a lot for inspiration um, and some Latin American evangelicals as well. As soon as their books would come out, we would get them translated or we would um, read them in English. It was kind of like um, it, it kept us alive, <laughs> the small little group that we were um, kind of spread out over um, Western Europe that in the areas that I grew up in. And so we would save up money to come to conferences to the United States and it was just so life-giving to be um, in an environment where you weren't made fun of um, for being a Christian, for believing that God existed, um, for loving Jesus. And so, um, yeah, I would say the movement, um, it, it helped us to, to get an understanding of the Bible, of how to express it. Uh, my parents were very internationally oriented, um, and so we often had evangelicals from all over the world at our house, from, from Egypt, from India, from Indonesia, all these different places. And so it was so wonderful to believe in Jesus um, and to learn more about him and his teachings and find that connection. Um, and similar to what Jeff is saying, um, it was very much connected also to action. Uh, it wasn't a dead faith. It was very much about what are we doing for our neighbors? Um, and so for me growing up in Europe, um, after the Iron Curtain went down in 89, uh, my family was very active um, with work in Eastern Europe. Uh, we traveled a lot through former Yugoslavian countries um, in the 90s when the war was happening. So as a 10, 11 year old, I saw refugees and um, we would give humanitarian help um, and Bibles to uh, people who wanted them. Um, and then two, three weeks later, there would be bombs dropped on those areas. And so especially going into these former communist countries um, with Bibles for churches that had been kind of um, driven underground during communism, tears streaming down people's faces when they would get a Bible, you know, and this, this connecting um, of these minority communities um, was very, yeah, very, very formative for me um, growing up. Thank you. So, Thank you. Yeah. 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 And so, and so uh, Bill, uh, how about you? How is even, what do you appreciate about evangelical Christianity? How's it shaped you as a person? Right. Right. Well, I came into evangelical faith, um, Christianity through young life. Um, that might be familiar to some of the listeners out there and young life was a very contextual, uh, organization that was introducing Christianity for the first time to high schoolers. And so it was, um, it was like a cup of cold water for a thirsty guy. Um, I grew up in a emotionally, um, uh, challenged <laughs> family, a little bit like Jeff. Um, my, my dad was a, a POW survivor from, um, the Japan occupation captured in the Philippines. So he was a lifelong PTSD sufferer. So our home was, um, was uh, full of lots of emotions. We would never know when dad would go off. And, um, and I, I always had a sense that uh, there was, uh, there was God, there was something out there. I couldn't have named it. Um, we weren't a church going family. And so when I encountered um, Young Life, there was just, there was something about uh, the camp experience. Um, I bought a Bible for a dollar and that, that has begun um, a lifelong um, Bible reading experience for me. Um, and reading the Psalms, um, ancient Hebrew poetry, um, it never gets old for me. Um, and then reading the Gospels, um, encountering Jesus, um, his teaching, his, um, his bumping into the people that the Gospels record, 
um, steals life giving to me. And as a young person, um, I got a vision and a passion to um, change the world. And like, like Jeff mentioned, I was part of the Jesus movement in the 70s. And, and I was determined to go <laughs> to the ends of the earth. And so that, that um, I met Julie along the way. We've been married 41 years. Um, and early, early on in our marriage, we um, were in Hong Kong. Um, then Taiwan had turned into 10 years in China. Um, and then many of those years were living among Muslims. And so um, day by day encounter with Muslims. Um, and I know we'll get, get into this a bit more with the other questions, but um, it just deepened, deepened my faith. Um, and in, in some ways, the, the blessing of the evangelical faith for, for me and many of my generation was um, some clarity, um, some moral clarity um, that was very helpful for me as a young person. Um, I'm very grateful for uh, Julie and I being able to raise three kids. They're all married. We got five grandkids and um, I I'm really grateful. It's the foundation of the, of our evangelical background that gave us the stability as a married couple, um, the help that we got from pastors and churches. So on the, on the family level, um, the, the shaping of the evangelical movement is huge. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And I, I just want to say to those of you who may be watching on Facebook Live or, or on, um, on Zoom, um, feel free to, to write a, any question you might have e on either of those in the Q&A or in the comment section on Facebook, and we'll, we'll try to get to those a little bit later on in our conversation. Um, so, Mikhail, um, could you please share your journey toward respect for and partnership with Muslims and, and you know, maybe in just in a couple of minutes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's so much to tell, but I'll keep it short. Uh, so it started for me when I took a class on intercultural communication at Fuller. Uh, we were encouraged to go to a place of worship of a different faith. Um, so some of the students and I decided to go to a mosque. Um, and I prayed and I said, God, I don't want this to just be a, a school assignment. If you have a Muslim friend for me, I would really like a Muslim friend. Um, so I would sit in the back, you know, upstairs in the women's section. Um, and right after the women were done doing their prayers, there's this girl, she makes a beeline straight at me. Um, and she introduces herself um, and make a long story short, we became really good friends. Um, she was originally from um, Palestine um, and I was born in Israel. So I also learned a lot about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict um, and been in her home and her family and um, learned to see the world through their eyes. Um, so it got me very passionate also about seeing peace and justice in the Holy Land. Um, and from there, I made more and more friends. Um, we did a lot of work bringing churches and mosques together. Um, and it wasn't always easy. Um, there's definitely a lot of, I'm sure that you've experienced as well, bumps in the road, uh, difficult people on the Muslim side, difficult people on the Christian side <laughs> um, to deal with. But eventually, after doing that work, um, more church mosque wise for a while, we decided that we really wanted to make do something that any Christian from any church, any Muslim from any mosque or school or community center could come. And so we made it much more of a, a grassroots initiative with big mixers and uh, a lot of training, um, bringing people together to talk about what misunderstandings do we have of each other, um, what you, studying the scriptures. And so I've been at the, at the birth, weddings, funerals of my Muslim friends. Um, they've walked with me and my family through some really, really intensely difficult times in my life and my family's life. Um, and so I'd say like this journey of almost a decade now um, has led me to say that um, some of my Muslim friends are like my, my own brothers and sisters and my mom and dad, um, like a second set of mom and dad, like this deep um, connection that we've built over the years. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, 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 and Bill, how about you? What was, you know, what was, what was your story of, uh, starting to partner and, and deepen respect for your Muslim neighbor. Right, right. Well, when, when Julie and I moved to Urumqi in Northwest China, um, we had no idea what was waiting for us there. And, and it was essentially isolation. This is, remember the 80s, um, and um, 
writing aerograms, if any of you remember aerograms. And, and so emotionally, we, um, we were so, so needy as a young couple. We had two small children. And it was our, our Uyghur Muslim neighbors who really came to our rescue. And, uh, and it wasn't easy for them to, to adopt us, to bring us into their home. Um, the, the Communist Party is, um, the, um, is sort of, a, it's a big brother. And so they, they took risks in befriending us. And, oh, I, I remember when um, Julie was pregnant with our, our second and one of our closest friends, a fellow teacher, um, his wife was also pregnant. And so the, um, the two women were going through the pregnancy together. And then, and then um, she, she became ill with, um, with diabetes and ended up losing the baby. And it was, it was like a tragedy. We felt that tragedy. I, I still feel it. It's over 30 years ago. And so just doing life, I remember we had in a we had a um we were living in a dormitory and there there was they locked the door at 11. i remember hopping over the gate to go to my friend unwar's home to be with him after this and we just we just cried together we prayed together we were really brothers and really so so from that time on it's been a um uh, it's been a family very much like Mikkel has said we've um, then as we've come back to North America these last 10 years um, had Bosnian and as well as our, our Uyghur friends and um, Pakistani and Arabs um, into our lives. Our lives would be without them. I can't imagine my life without our Muslim friends. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. How about you? I, we, I've said a little bit of your story in the introduction, but you know, I still still would love to hear you. You give us a little bit of it. Oh, you're you're on mute there, brother. Thank you. That's <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, I, I actually consider myself this next part of my life as being an advocate for American Muslims, and that now that's not exclusive. I mean, I also have a large uh, international following of, of Muslims too. But, you know, in the United States, I, 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 I'm really trying through my channel and others to be an advocate for American Muslims. And um, but you, as you know, as an evangelical pastor, Americans, Muslims weren't really on our radar until 9-11. I mean, we knew they were there, but we, they weren't really on our radar in a significant way. And so the, we I think many of us kind of approached them in a very benign way. And we. Um, were taught at the Christian university I attended and also at the fundamentalist church I went to, you know, this, I, I love Israel, but we were taught Christian Zionism, you know, the whole concept that um, Israel has to occupy all its land. That doesn't just mean the West Bank. It means, I mean, if you to take in Jordan, you take in, I, I mean, all those areas before Jesus can come back and Jerusalem had to be the capital. So anything that was a threat to that, and that, that would be Muslims, was seen as just in the way. So, but we didn't really have a lot of feelings. When 9-11 came, it triggered kind of like an internal bomb that these people are a threat. And I internally believe I hated Muslims, and I would never use those words, but I felt that um, these people are all either terrorists or they are, at the very least, empathetic towards terrorist causes and there's this underground conspiracy uh, to overthrow the world. And some of my, my closest Muslim friends will say, most Muslims don't even know the other mosques exist in the same town. <laughs> you know? And uh, our biggest argument is, are McDonald's french fries halal or haram? You know, like, come <laughs> on, people. And, but anyway, you know, my story, I really, but it, this became a crusade for me for a while to really speak against this. And I said things I regret now. And so I ended up taking, this is the real short version, a three-month class on Islam. And it was a class sponsored by an evangelical church that was actually trying to address this. And I didn't want to go, but I ended up going. 
and I learned a lot and I realized that Islam is just like, you know, no, no evangelical wants to be labeled as every evangelical is to the far right. No evangelical wants to be labeled that if you, you know, you have to be a part of this political party. And I realized Muslims feel the very same way. So I, I'll never forget, I was on a Starbucks on Creedmoor Road in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I was wrestling with this thing in my soul. And I said, God, if you want me to build a bridge. And at that time, I said to the house of Ishmael, you're going to have to give me a sign so clear I'll never doubt it. And a little Muslim boy named Omar, and I'm probably going to make a documentary about this because I have so many people writing, you got to make a documentary about this. Mm-hmm. He was five years old, came over to my table, and I prayed for a sign. And he said, sir, my name is Omar. I'm here to teach you Arabic. I was shocked. For the next 30 minutes, he tried to teach me. And during that time, my heart was transformed. I had, a, you know, of course, being evangelicals and charismatic, you know, we are very much a people of experience that God somehow manifests to us. And from that moment on, I, my heart changed. I never, the hatred left me. And I walked out of the room that day and I said, I'm going to be a peacemaker. But I don't know what I'm doing. There are no evangelical models. And yeah, you had Rick Love and you had Carl Madeiras and you had, um, some others, but they were overseas. You didn't have really anyone here that I knew of. You had Catholics, you had others that were leading the way. So we became, you know, they say the kingdom of the blind, the one-eyed man's king. I, I didn't realize it, but early on, with what little knowledge I had, I became an authority. <laughs> and um, so I spent, literally, I thought, okay, I, have, I need to deprogram myself. You know, and part of like with Black Lives Matter right now, I tell my, if I tell people, listen, you need to listen to what people of color are saying. If they're telling you this has happened, you need to believe them. Don't define their experience. So I spent a year going to the largest mosque in Raleigh. I went on Friday to all three prayer services. They used to say, you come more than Muslims do. <laughs> I would stay and eat lunch at the cafeteria. I would ask tons of questions, just tons of questions. I wanted to know. I needed to hear the Palestinian experience. I needed to hear that they're, what they have been through and others. And so through that, I kind of went through an internal deconstruction. And I um, realized, okay, these, these, are, these, these people are worthy of my respect and friendship. And then I began to realize, wow, if we're going to make a difference in the world, we're going to have to become partners. We're going to have to work. Not, and I don't mean that in a superficial way. We're going to have to become partners. And so that's what I really began to work on was getting people to eat together and hang out together and, explore their faith not in a polemical way but as friends and and i and we got them to do good i created a model where they would do projects together and it changed changed everything so that became a very important factor to me and um and i just developed a lot of respect and so from that to this day i i i even think it's more important now than ever that we challenge muslims to say look we have to be our leaders are in agreement from the common word initiative on yeah. That we agree on loving God, loving neighbor, and tr- and tr- and treating other people the way we, we're, we're in agreement that that's the core. Jesus said that's the core. Nothing's greater than this. And if that's true, it's got to leave the academic realm. It's got to. I mean, it started there. Thank God. But like Macau has been really great on a grassroots level of living out that. So we got to go out of that, and that means friendship. That means being getting uncomfortable. That means getting involved in each other's lives, making space for that. And it's the same way with people of color right now. We got to make, we got to get outside this realm of uh, whiteness, <laughs> I call it. And so that's what, that's what I did. So, and I've been doing that over and over again for the last 15 years, you know, and it has made such a, such a big difference. And I believe that, that we have the power to change the world, but we got to do it together. Muslims and Christians have to do this together. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You know, so I, when I was a little kid, my mom had multiple sclerosis and she, um, and, and we were kind of, we were kind of on the outside of the community really. Cause my, my family had gone through a bankruptcy after having lost the, the farm sort of, um, grandpa gave, you know, sold the farm instead of passing it on to my dad and then through a bankruptcy. And then my mom got, you know, got, was diagnosed with MS. And, and so we were, we were sort of really on the outside you know, of the community and, and we were kind of shunned in some ways and we, and we were, and I, I was kind of bullied as a kid, you know, but I was, I was pretty strong and stubborn, so I wasn't going to let it overcome me, but I, 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 I hated it and I felt lonely and it, and it, it didn't feel good, you know, 
And I, I watched the way the community withdrew their support from my family because they were afraid that MS was going to catch in some way, right? In fact, I had a woman tell me that the reason my family, that, that my family had a hard time is because we weren't good enough Christians. So, so that was, that was, uh, that's when I became a theologian at seven years old right there, you know? Mm. So long story short, you know, I, I, I didn't engage a lot with interfaith stuff. I, I really thought that really wasn't central. Um, but as I got older, I began to think, you know, it'd be kind of interesting to have a conversation with the, with some folk. And so I had a conversation between a Buddhist, a Muslim and myself on some interesting topics. And we were invited to go out, this Muslim man and I were invited to go to a military town and, and share a, uh, a little bit about, you know, you're kind of trying to help reduce the Islamophobia, you know, there. And I just remember sitting up there and watching my Muslim friend engage this, this, this crowd of 90 people, about half of whom were visibly hating him. I mean, they were, they were afraid and they were hating him. And I was sitting up there looking at this and, and it, it just, it just spoke to the core of me, you know, that, um, that if, is this what they, is this what Muslims experience all the time? And I did four, four or five more events with, with my friend and, and it just kept happening and the same questions kept coming up all the time. And, uh, and then finally, uh, you know, after I had done a whole bunch more, uh, large presentations around the state, especially in small towns, um, one day, you know, I just, I felt like I have to do this. And part of it too was the, the recognition in seminary that Lutherans had really set the table for what happened in Nazi Germany in lots of ways and participated in it and been in denial about it, been active participants in it. And, uh, and, and like, you know, we can't be making that same mistake. And so, you know, I ended up leaving, leaving uh, the churches I was serving to do that work full time, you know, without yeah. knowing where the money would come from. I just knew I had to do it because I think in the Lutheran church, you know, there's, you know, one of our greatest sins is passivity. We think that what we think about people matters. We think what, what we what we feel about people matters. But, you know, that that's not really quite what Jesus was talking about. He didn't say, well, love your enemy in your heart, but please don't, please don't love them, you know, yeah. in, in public, you know. So, um, so my, my journey actually sounds, you know, all of our journeys are, are similar in some ways. You know, we, we got to meet some people, we, and, and there was transformation in that. And um, I, I guess, you know, uh, you know, Bill, like, what have you learned about being a faithful Christian? I mean, in, in engagement with Muslims, like, what have you learned uh, for, you know, in that in that engagement? Yeah, so much. Uh, one is the, when I get outside of my comfort zone, when, um, that's when things happen. Uh, we have a, we have a local mosque here. And I had heard through the grapevine that um, that it was uh, it was the most radical mosque in our region, um, and immediately I, my biases kicked in, and I avoided that mosque like the plague um, until uh, my youngest son Nate, his um, Nate and Sarah, right across the hall from them. Um, was a young Libyan couple. And this is just as the Libyan civil war was kicking off and uh, their financial support was being cut off by the, uh, by the Libyan government. And so I ended up um, with Julie and, and we formed a coalition and basically uh, said, we're not gonna let this family uh, become homeless. Um, we're going to take care of this family and we're not quite sure how to do it. We invited them to come live with us. We begged them to come into our home. They, they weren't comfortable with that. Um, but um, we have a cousin, Sarah Bryant, who is one of my heroes, who was preparing her house, unbeknownst to us, uh, a mother-in-law apartment for a refugee asylum-seeking family. Wow. And so... We, um, 
at this um, never to be forgotten Advent service at our, our vineyard church down in the U district of Seattle. Um, we were asked to, to, um, to preach. And so preaching on Mary and Joseph and so our Libyan friends are there. And so it's this idea of if we're going to talk about Muslims, let's have Muslims in the room. Yeah. I, I don't want to, I don't want to talk anymore to groups of Christians. Um, in a theoretical way without having my Muslim friends come. Mm. So I invited Haroon to come up and Sarah was pregnant at, at this time. And I gave him the mic and said, what is it like to be um, a young expectant husband, um, refugee, asylum seeking man right now? And he just told his story. Wow. And and it it had such an impact on that that small little uh, group of Christians that um, because they were seeing the they were seeing the Christmas story, which can be so theoretical, um, like that was then. No, this is this is now. Um, we all, whatever city you're listening in right now, um, they're asylum seeking um, families, Muslims or Buddhists or. Um, and we have the opportunity to reach out and love them. And so we all went for a meal afterwards. Um, a couple other cousins were there. And Sarah said at that meal, I, I want you to come home and, and stay with me. I have a place ready for you. And that couple stayed um, over two years wow. with my cousin in a rural Washington State County um, where there were hardly any Muslims. And this couple became like the heart. Um, the ladies at the at this evangelical church taught um, Sarah English. Um, provided for they had two babies during that time. Provided everything that this couple needed. Um, and so, just just that bridge building between uh, this Libyan couple um, and. Uh, I'm rambling here a little bit, but I'll just close with this one story. Of uh, So I was speaking actually at this, in this rural community, uh, and Haroon again was with me. And uh, during the Q&A, um, an elderly gent said, said, um, why do all the Muslims want to kill us? Why do they want to kill us? And so I had the mic and I, I handed the mic over to Haroon and said, Haroon, why don't, why don't you take that one? And uh, so he looked at the man um, and he said, he said, sir, I don't want to kill you. In fact, I love you. You're part of the neighborhood that has accepted me and my wife. And, and he said, I'll tell you who wants to kill who. At that time, ISIS had surrounded his hometown in Libya. And these were foreign fighters that had come. He said, those fighters want to kill my family and my wife's family. And we have a ring of um, the defenders were all the local, local folks, the bakers, the, the butchers, the, the policemen, the firemen uh, were defending their families from ISIS fighters. He said, those are the people that want to kill my family. But me, I love you. And it just, it changed the atmosphere of the room right there. Wow. Yeah, we so often, um, people so often confuse the majority religion of a country for the politics and all of that that happen in a country. And, and they're not always unrelated, but they're, they're most often not anywhere near the same thing. So, so Jeff, what, what have you learned about being a disciple of Jesus by engagement with Muslims? You know, I'm a better disciple. I really am. I think that... Um, being with Muslims has helped me to really challenge my theology. You know what I'm saying? It really has helped me to reflect. You know, as, as Christians, we have our creeds. We have our, our theological statements. And sometimes we, re we say them, and we, it's kind of like uh, military people. You know, when you're talking to military people, they'll start using Yama M64 or whatever. <laughs> they'll describe things in the language they assume you learn. And Muslims would, would, would ask me questions about my faith. Why do you believe Jesus is um, 
uh, begot, you know, what do you mean by begotten of God? What do you mean by those terms? And, and it really was very powerful, you know, to, I had to go back and reflect and they did too. I would come back and ask them questions about jihad. I'd say, okay, listen, I, we're close enough. We're having supper tonight. I'm not here to create an argument. Explain to me the whole jihad thing. I'm not, I'm concerned about this. And you know what? And, and it, it, it changed me to change them. So I'm a better follower of Christ as my, because of my engagement of Muslims. And I've had many Muslims tell me, Jeff, I'm a better Muslim. You know, I don't want to become a Christian, but I'm a better Muslim because we've studied the scriptures together, the Quran, the Bible. We've had these discussions together. And one thing I learned too, there's, a, there, there's an idea or, or a um, worldview I think a lot of Christians have is we're Christians. We know what, what we are the best parents. We are the best this, we're the best this, and that and that. We can't learn. Our goal of mission life is to teach everybody else. What I learned is, man, I I would go to my head. There were Muslim fathers that were better fathers than I was. And I would go to them and say, hey, look, I'm having this problem with my daughter. You know, can you give me some feedback? Can you give me some? I've watched them. You know, I watched their piety. I watched their devotion. I watched how they treated their families. I watched how they they did things and so i would i would look at each muslim and say in my own selfish way what can i learn from them you know what i mean what can i get from them then they did the same thing to me i, I have one funny story one muslim one time he is a wonderful oh my gosh he's one of my oldest muslim friends and he's a he's a key influencer in his city but he'd get so frustrated at the muslim community and say jeff i gotta talk to you i'm frustrated with the muslim community I'm thinking about coming up, becoming a Christian, maybe a Jew or a Buddhist. What do you think? <laughs> you know, and he would laugh. I know he didn't mean it, but he felt close enough to me to have that conversation, you know. And so I learned, I've learned a lot from Muslims. I've, I really, and I have a deep respect for their journey. And they're just human beings, just like the rest of us. And we learn from each other. And one of the things that I've learned is the power of encounter. Once two people become friends, uh, they're never the same again. Mm -hmm. They're never the same again. So a lot of my Muslim friends that were going back to their country, I would do a debriefing with them and they would say things like, Jeff, I want you to know we no longer hate Christians. They had been taught, some of them, that Christians were bad. We're going to go back and make friends with our Christian neighbors. In our country, we don't talk to each other, you know. And on my channel, I've had Muslims that were obviously connected to radicalism not all in or violence. And I've had Muslims write me saying, Hey, after hearing about Omar, we're not going to, uh, we renounce violence or we're not going to kill this person in our village, <laughs> or I'm going to reach out to a Jewish person now in the same way with some Christians. And so there's this power of story and power of encounter. And I, and I, I remember I was, I went to Sudan for three trips and I was coming back and I had several of my Christian friends, that said, we want to pick you up at the airport. And I, but I also had Muslim friends. Well, you know, the natural inclination would be get your Christian friends to pick you up. So mm -hmm. I told my Christian friends, I said, nope, nope, nope. I want my Muslim friends to pick me up. Why? Because we're not friends until we are inconveniencing each other. You know what I mean? We're really not. Mm -hmm. And so I told them, I said, pick me up at the airport. We'll go get coffee afterwards. And so I've been transformed by it. I really have. And I have learned so much. I tell you that. The, uh, the Muslim fathers I know love their kids. They're good fathers. They're people of, of uh, strong values. And the women, are, the women are powerhouses. Let me tell you something. In this country, people act like Muslim, Muslim women don't have a voice. Listen, there are more educated Muslim women in this country. <laughs> and I've been in meetings at mosques where the women have challenged the men on issues. And so I, um, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot from them. And uh, they're, they're beautiful people. So, Mikhail, how about you? What have you learned about being a faithful follower of Christ? Yeah, I would say a lot of this very similar things. It seems to kind of be a theme with um, all of us. You know, Muslims ask questions that you have ne never had to think about before. You know, what do we mean when we say that Jesus is the son of God? You know, where does that phrase come from? We just kind of hear it and believe it, but we don't really know, like, the depths of it. And so to be really challenged in that, um, as well as why I believe my scriptures um, uh, are not corrupted, you know, all these different kinds of things. Um, at first, you're kind of like taken aback a little bit with those first few instances. It was like, whoa, what? 
<laughs> um, but then you're like, okay, that's okay. Let's talk about this. Let's, let's explore this. Right. Um, I would also say my Muslim friends are really, especially as a Dutch person, uh, all the fun jokes about Dutch people being stingy. <laughs> we like to say we're effective with our money, but we're not that hospitable um, and generous as my Muslim friends are. And so I've been really challenged uh, in that sense, you know, um, to be more, to learn hospitality, to learn uh, generosity um, to, to a much, much greater extent. Um, than I had before. Um, yeah, and it's, I think most of all, like one of my closest Muslim friends, she's a Quran expert and she knows her Quran inside and out. She's, she's deeply, deeply connected, kind of like what um, Jeff was saying, um, powerhouse, awesome, strong woman. Um, and seeing her dive into the original languages and wanting to like piece words together um even though i had an mdiff i kind of felt like uh why do i have to learn greek and hebrew who really cares you know <laughs> we have an english translation but boy has it made me want to dive into the original languages to connect deeper with my scriptures of what why do we translate it this way what are these words coming from um and so i'd say long story short um it's grown my love for jesus for his teachings um and for the scriptures you know, I, saw, I appreciate so much of what all of you said, and it, it really mirrors my own experience as well. I think, you know, part of it, I was thinking, you know, Jeff, uh, you know, that, that the scripture says that the, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, which, which is part of, of saying that, that awe of life and the, and the, the creator who, who made that life um, is, is the beginning. So saying you don't know. Mm -hmm. is it and, and so engaging others and I've, i so have come to believe that engagement with other people helps us to experience our own tradition even more deeply you know than before which all of you have experienced and i have too and and i think the other piece is um is is to to witness the the grace under fire you know of many of our muslim neighbors you know even young kids who in junior high and high school have to answer questions uh, from people whose folks are watching, you know, Fox News or whatever, um, and to watch their grace under pressure and 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 in responding to that, you know, and it it has it has really been a way for me to recognize that, you know, when Jesus says, "Take up your cross and follow me," he's not talking about putting on a necklace, mm -hmm. and and he, he's talking about risking yourself in love for your neighbor and in love for, for the God who created your neighbor. Like that's the heart of it. And I've seen my Muslim neighbors do that. Risking their themselves for the better benefit of their community, for other groups that are, that are being disenfranchised and oppressed. And, uh, and, and, and they've really challenged me to, to, to really, you know, up my game and say, okay, am I willing to risk myself? you know, uh, for my neighbor, be, be inconvenienced, be even endangered sometimes, have people not like me. And I don't know about you all, but I love people like me. <laughs> but all of a sudden, standing up for Muslims, a lot of folk don't like me so much, right? <laughs> and I think that's taught me a lot about, about being a follower of Jesus that I think maybe was only, you know, in my head before. And I, and I, and I just want to hear now, like in, in, our, in our last, you know, 10, 12 minutes here, I love to hear about what you're currently doing uh, to build relationships between Muslims and Christians and, and counter anti-Muslim bigotry. And, and Mikhail, if I could start with you, I'd, I'd love to do that. Yeah, sure. Um, so some of the things that we're doing um, are uh, during Ramadan and Christmas, uh, we organize a lot of home dinners. Um, and so I, we've, you know, often, around Ramadan you're invited to the mosque and you know in kind of like these communal settings uh, but we really felt like to truly help those people that really struggle with fears uh, and maybe even hatred um, that to be in someone's home in this very personal space of course like we filter you know as much as we can if people are really very troubled then uh, we wouldn't invite them but it's been very very grassroots like friends invite friends um, and so we'll, we'll be in the homes of, of Muslims. Now with COVID, that wasn't possible this past Ramadan. And so we did um, virtual Ramadan experiences nice. um, where we paired about 100 Muslims and 100 Christians in small groups online um, to connect. Um, and so we kind of have like we've built um, 
we've been very inspired also by Jeff's work. Um, he's, he's been kind of a mentor to me and, and, and taught me so much um, of the work that he's doing. Um, and we've taken um, some of the things that he's done. Um, so we offered the help people meet, make your first Muslim friend. Um, and then the second part is like come to training where we go much deeper into what I call what's happening in the back of your mind. So it's like over here, we're like, I love my Muslim friend. Yay. I hug you. I love your food. We're friends. But what about Sharia? But what about, you know, yeah. um, it still lingers. I call them lingering questions. Um, and so we want to fully bring those to the forefront. Um, so we often, again, meet in homes with about 20, 30, 40 people. Um, and we have kind of a guided process in which we tackle these big misunderstandings. And then for those Muslims and Christians that want to, um, they, they take a next step and they engage in scripture study. So what, is, what does the scripture say about different topics? And they dive deeper into that. So those are kind of three main things that we do. Well, that's, that's fantastic. I, and I, I want to keep learning from you about the work that you're doing because, you know, part of it is how do we help uh, different uh, communities of faith, you know, in, in areas to, to engage in this kind of work. And a lot of people just make it way too complicated. Yeah. So, uh, so Jeff, yeah, yeah. So, so Jeff, how about you? What are you currently doing to, yes. to do this work? Well, I, I live you know, in, in, when I was in Raleigh, with that we spent 10 years in Raleigh, had a flourishing work and we had a work in Chicago. When I first, we moved to the coast 10 years ago and I ended up joining an Episcopal church here and the first thing that I did when I went through the door was, we've heard about you. There's a mosque about a half a mile away from us. Can you help us? I'm like, wow, I'm not used to people being so <laughs> eager. So for the last couple of years, we've built a relationship with this Islamic center. Yeah. And the president has been a great friend. We've had multiple meals together. Um, we're both small, small congregations. And we even did, We've uh, the women have gotten together uh, some and, we even did a, I'm, I'm into projects, like let's do something good. So when Hurricane Florence hit, the mosque was damaged and our church went over and helped do some landscaping and repair. And then also the mosque and the church got together to raise money and supplies to take to the Brunswick Family Services. And i never forget when I went in, they were thanks said, go back and thank your church for doing this. I said, I will, but I want you to know this was in partnership with the Islamic Center of Wilmington. This was a, I wanted them to know that they were part of that. So we're gonna keep expanding that. And I'm also developing a friendship with, um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Warth Dean Muhammad. He was the one who pulled the uh, lot of African-Americans out of the Nation of Islam into Sunni Islam. And it's uh, the Mosque Care Network. So we're, go we're building some, a, a good relationship together now. And I'm doing a lot online. God's given me this vision for doing local. I always want to keep on the front uh, in the, the trenches, so to speak. But I've started this YouTube channel and I've got about 3000 subscribers, mostly Muslim. And I'm seeing, I, I can't believe just the impact of this thing. Um, I didn't even know what I was doing. You know, I'm just telling stories, the comments, the people, I mean, I could write a book with the comments alone that have come in. And now I've got more Muslim friends on my Facebook page than I do Christian. Than I do Christian. I mean, they're every day. I kid you not. I've got a. I started a Facebook page called "I Follow the Path." I got four thousand followers, mostly Muslim. Every day I'm getting at least sixty friend requests from Muslims around the world. It's like I, I did not anticipate this. Every morning I'm getting hello messages. Can you talk from Gaza? Can you do? I mean, it's like okay, God, you're up to something here. You know, you're up to something. And I'm even seeing people who have been, <clears throat> some in some countries, anti-Christian, who are now wanting to talk. They're wanting to have the conversations because, you know, I tell people my goal has never been ideological conformity. My goal has always been to get people to like me. I've learned if you're going to be a peacemaker, you, people got to like you. They got to buy into you before they buy into me. And if they like you, so I've been doing little things. One guy said, I'm, can you help me get a thousand subscribers on YouTube? I said, yes, I can, but you got to follow the steps. And so I did. He, he said, he was shocked. I helped him. He's a school teacher. And so I'm trying to do little acts of kindness right now. And with Rayhan Alawala, do you know that name? No. Rayhan is a major entrepreneur in Pakistan. He's trying to end poverty in Pakistan and in the world. And he's trying to build a bridge for an Indian Pakistan. He and I have become friends. 
And so um, he has this thing where he requires all his followers to interview a bunch of people, interview a bunch of people. So I'm setting up things, interviews. I'm doing a lot of interviews so they can have a global consciousness. So there's people out there, man, that are, that are really, so that's what I'm doing. I love the online stuff. Uh, it's creating an opportunity and I haven't got it all figured out, but I feel like I'm pioneering something new, but I always want to keep a local work going too. I always want to keep in the trenches there working with, I'm part of the Wilmington ministerial round table, which is very diverse and I want to be involved in, uh, what's happening right now in the in with black lives matters and being in, in the, in the in, and Muslims are getting involved. What people don't realize is this is an important issue to Muslims. So, I just encourage evangelicals. I say, look, you know, guys, we don't want to be on the wrong side of history. This is another the civil rights movement. This is part two, you know, and uh, let's get involved. And Muslims are very, very much open to getting involved. So I'm just trying to be a, a yeah. So that's what I'm trying to do now. <laughs> well, I, and I and I hear I hear from you, Jeff, that you know, your your relational focus is continuing, even though you're using the. The, the 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 social media you know so right. I just, that, that really just came through really clear clear to me so bill how about you what are you up to my friend well um like mccall we have built our work a lot on the the foundation that jeff built in raleigh the communities of reconciliation um has been absolutely foundational and so we we started with um a group of four four Arab young men, and I was able to, um, to recruit some young, um, young Christian adult guys to, to join me. And that, that started our, um, our, our work here in Seattle back in 2012. Uh, we do a lot of what we call peace feasts, um, and they take different forms. Um, and mm. mostly getting Muslims and Christians in the same room together around food, and with with different topics, um, some very similar Nicole, to what you're doing down in LA. But a couple years ago, things shifted for us uh, because we we lived in Northwest China with the Uyghur people. They're Sunni Muslims. They're 10, 11 million, and they are in the midst of a genocide right now. And so it was in 2017 that the Chinese government began to to incarcerate um, local men, women, and children from teenage up to seriously it's 70s and 80s. And we just couldn't sit by. Um, so we, we, Julie and I made the decision to go public, to become advocates um, because our, our friends, many of whom we know, many were colleagues, teaching colleagues at the main university where, where I taught and then was a graduate student. At, um, and so we've we sort of combined the peace feasts and we've loved connecting with Chinese evangelical churches. Mm. We have um, maybe 4,000 Chinese evangelical churches across the U.S. And they, they tend to be conservative. But when they, when they hear about um, that Uyghurs are Chinese citizens, and when they actually find out that um, that deeds of of deep, deep evil are being perpetrated, um, that that impacts them. So we've we've been getting Uyghur leaders together at at Chinese churches, and we've broadened it out to to other churches as well. Mm. Maybe some of you who are are listening will um, will get in touch with me uh, through Terry or. And, and we can put on an event like this at, at your church. We can do it by Zoom as well in this COVID era. Um, but we're finding we have about 10,000 expatriate Uyghurs here in North America. Every single one has a close kin, someone in their close family network um, who has been incarcerated in these um, horrific concentration camps. So it's... Um, We've, we've focused on this because it's happening right now. Um, many of us have, are familiar with the term never again, dating back to the Holocaust era. And, and we take that very seriously. Um, we're familiar with our dear Bosnian friends who underwent a, a genocide in mid-90s in Europe. Um, 
And so it's, it's very sobering work. But there's, there's three amazing human rights, uh, Uyghur human rights group, the Campaign for Uyghurs, Uyghur American Association, and the Uyghur Human Rights Project, all located in D.C., that are doing fantastic work. Um, so we're, we've considered an honor to partner with them. So Bill, I, I just want to say I so appreciate that work, and I, I, you know, I'd love to have all of you all on, all on again sometime again. But I, I also want to invite you to you come on with some of your Uyghur leader friends, and and anything we can do to kind of help tell that story right now. And and it was I was so shocked and appalled to, to hear that the president of the U.S. you know likely told uh, Xi Jinping of China to go ahead and 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 and, uh, and engage in this genocide, and I. Uh, I, I'm just shocked and appalled and horrified by it all. But I'm I'm deeply, um, you know, humbled and and also encouraged to hear all three of you uh, talk about your journey and to hear how how similar it is to mine. And I'm so grateful all of you could come on tonight and and be with us. So thank you all very much. Thanks, Terry. Yeah. So you can learn more about uh, the ministry, the work of of Past to Understanding at pasttounderstanding.org. And, and there you, you'll find links to our YouTube channel where we have Challenge 2.0 hosted by Jeff Renner. Um, and we, we're also engaging in a, in a Facts Over Fear campaign to counter anti-Muslim bigotry. We came up with that name before COVID-19. It's been sort of taken over by some of the news outlets at this point. And we wanna encourage you all to, to think about registering for Holden Village Interfaith Week, which is coming up on, on July 19th through 24th. We're going to have six nights of programming, live programming. And if you go to our website, you can find uh, some of the pre-week media up there um, to, to kind of educate yourself about um, the how and why of interfaith and to hear some positive stories about how people are using interfaith work to, to make better communities and to do bridge building and peacemaking. And, and thank you all again for joining us tonight. Uh, be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors. Thanks for listening.